Greetings. I am Dr. Lauren abder father, director of the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh. The Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh connects the horrors of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism with injustices of today. Through education, the Holocaust Center seeks to address these injustices and empower individuals to build a more civil and humane society. The Generation Speaker series carries on the legacy of Holocaust survivors by featuring children and grandchildren of survivors telling their families' stories. This series is generously sponsored by the Sylvia and Martin Snow Family Fund, the Allegheny Regional Asset District, and the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh. Thank you for joining us. Today's program is a very special one because we have with us Deborah Stuber, a daughter of survivors, and her parents, Edith and Kurt Leuster. Debbie Leuster Stuber was born and raised on Long Island and majored in elementary education at the State University of Oneonta, New York. She moved to Pittsburgh in 1991 and now calls it her hometown. Shortly after moving to Pittsburgh, Debbie met the former Holocaust Center director, Linda Hurwitz, and has been a volunteer with the center on and off for the past 20 plus years. She has one sister in Brooklyn, New York, and her parents live in Boynton Beach, Florida. She's married and has three grown sons. She's an inside sales and senior customer service representative for a local electronics manufacturer. Telling her parents' story is one of her passions in life, the other being craft beer. If you get her started, she could talk about that for hours as well. The program will begin with Debbie speaking, and after she has spoken, we will address questions to Debbie and to her parents. Without further ado, please welcome Debbie Stuber. Thank you. It's my honor and privilege to share with you my parents' story today. I'd like to thank the Holocaust Center and the staff who are a positive impact in the community of Pittsburgh and beyond. This past January, marked the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. As time goes by, the voices and the eyewitnesses of the Holocaust are quickly dwindling and at a very high rate in the last few months due to COVID-19. It's my generation and the next to carry their torch. The Anti-Defamation League, a leading anti-hate organization in the United States, determined that in 2018, there were 1,859 anti-Semitic incidents here. <clears throat> Not one day goes by that I don't hear about another one, either here or abroad. In November of 2018, shortly after the Tree of Life massacre in Pittsburgh, my sister spoke at a vigil in Brooklyn, New York. And in part of her speech, she mentioned that when she and I were girls, my father would always say, you know, the Holocaust could happen again, and you better have your passports ready to go to Israel. My sister would respond, Dad, this is the United States. That would never happen here. I personally don't think that the Holocaust could ever happen again, but with the climate in the world today, we have many reasons to be concerned. My mom, Edith Leuchter, pictured here, was born in Bruxelles, Germany on December 31st, 1927. Her father, Max Loeb, owned Max Loeb Grocery Store, named after him, and he sold canned goods and produce, butcher supplies and tools. The family lived above the grocery store. <clears throat> These are my grandparents, Julia and Max Loeb, my grandmother, Julia, again, my grandfather, my mother, Edith, and her brother, Heinz, here, and here. In July of 1938, after Max saw the handwriting on the wall, he emigrated to the United States. The plan was to send for everybody else in the family, but unfortunately, that never happened. When he got to New York, he sent this telegram to his wife and children. As you can see, the telegram <clears throat> has the swastika emblem on it. On Kristallnacht, otherwise known as the Night of Broken Glass, November 9th and 10th, 1938, Edith was awakened in the wee hours of the morning. She could hear sirens and breaking glass and could even see flames outside of her bedroom window. 
at which point she crawled into bed with her mother, Yulia, to seek comfort. Yulia said it was no longer safe to stay, so they moved to Matilda Vile's house, Edith's grandmother, about 10 minutes away. Soon after, Heinz, Edith's brother, was sent to a school in Frankfurt. Edith's aunt said that there wasn't enough food in the home in Bruxelles as there were already shortages and he was sent to a school there. Edith is bitter about this to this day because she feels that if Heinz wasn't sent away, things could have turned out very differently. From that school, he was moved to an orphanage in Frankfurt and eventually deported to Dereisenstadt in Czechoslovakia. This is a letter and a drawing that Heinz wrote from Theresienstadt to an aunt and uncle or his father in the United States. Um, his aunt and uncle were still living in Germany. You can also see the stamp with Hitler's <clears throat> face on it. We don't know, but I believe this drawing is of Heinz and his sister, my mother Edith. This was the model camp, Theresienstadt, that Hitler invited the Red Cross to, to show how well he was treating all the prisoners, which obviously wasn't true. In May 1944, he was deported to Auschwitz, the infamous concentration camp in Poland. He was put in a specific area called the Theresen Family Camp. 17,517 people were deported from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz. As the Allies were beginning to learn about the Holocaust, this camp was created within Auschwitz to mislead the world about the final solution. Heinz was on a transport of 2,499 people. Upon arrival, he was given a prisoner number between A1445 and A2506. Of the 17,517 people who were deported from Auschwitz, from Theresienstadt on to Auschwitz, only 261 survived. Heinz was not one of them. He either died of starvation or disease or was killed in the gas chambers. On October 22nd, 1940, about 29,000 Jews were deported from Bruxelles and surrounding areas in Germany. Edith, her mother Julia, and her grandmother Matilda were given one hour to get their things ready to walk to the railroad station in the town they could only bring a few suitcases. Before I continue, I'd like to show you some footage that was discovered only a few years ago in the Bruxelles, Germany archives. It's one minute and 30 seconds long. Just this past February, 2020, we discovered that my mother and her grandmother in the are in the footage. It's possible that Edith's grandmother is as well, but Edith could only confirm that it's herself and her mother. This is my mother on the right um, with a hat and next to her mother with a hat. And this is who we might think is Matilda here on the left um, with gray hair and carrying some things. Obviously, this was extremely upsetting for 
my family and specifically my mother uh, to watch and to see that she was in the footage. When they got to the railroad station, Julia asked for permission to call her son Heinz in Frankfurt to see if he could join them. She was denied this request, but she was given approval to go home to look for the papers that she said she had to emigrate to the United States. She went back twice, but for whatever reason, the papers were not there. From inside the railroad station, they could see outside the windows. Townspeople, including children, were yelling that they were happy to see the Jews leave Bruxelles and were spitting upon them. Eventually, they boarded the train and they breathed a small sigh of relief because as they crossed the Rhine River, they realized they were traveling south as opposed to east towards Poland. A few days later, they arrived in southwestern France where they were put in an internment camp called Gus. Here, Edith had to use straw to make mattresses and there were too few blankets for too many people. Edith described that it was extremely disgusting and very muddy. She went to school, but she learned very little. In April of 1941, her and her mother and her grandmother were deported to another camp called Leap Salt in the area of Perpignan, still in the south of France. By this point, Yulia had a hernia and was ill. At this camp, the barracks were infested with insects and according to my mom, the beds looked like cages for rabbits. One bright spot was that Max, Edith's father, was able to send packages and money from the United States. Edith was always hungry. She says the food consisted of watery soup with vegetables that looked like weeds. Yulia was able to save the bread that they were rationed in the morning until the evening <clears throat> to give to Edith when she got back from school in the evening. She had rosy cheeks, so the other prisoners were actually jealous because they thought that they were getting more food than them. The Vichy government of France gave the difficult choice to the parents in the camp to sign their children over to an organization called OSE, which translates to Children's Aid Society. This was a Jewish underground organization that operated throughout the war and saved over 5,000 Jewish children. Edith had to say goodbye to her mother and her grandmother, Matilda, but she could not hug Matilda because at this point, Matilda had body lice. A few months later, she got a telegram from her mother that she was deported to Drancy, another internment camp in Paris, and eventually deported to Auschwitz. She hopes that she didn't make it there and died of the hernia in the cattle car on the long trip there. She also found out that her grandmother Matilda died in a hospital in Perpignan and luckily wasn't deported. By the end of the war, Edith was in five schools and orphanages. While she was in one school, she was also a part-time nanny for a family from the area of Alsace-Lorraine which is the ge geographic area between France and Germany. Edith's false papers indicated that she was also from that area, which made sense because she was from Germany and was already learning French. Here she was given the false name, Edith Labay. My mother was in this orphanage pictured here called Majelier for about one and a half years. She made a lot of friends there. Here she met a boy named Kurt and he really liked her, but she thought he was a big shot and didn't pay much attention to him. Toward the end of the war, she became a French Girl Scout and upon liberation was able to get an affidavit from her father, Max, and immigrated to the United States. She reached the port of New York on April 23rd, 1946. This is an ad that Max placed in a German Jewish newspaper called the Aufbau, searching for his wife and son, my uncle and my grandmother, who, as I mentioned earlier, were killed in Auschwitz. My father, Kurt Leuchter, 
was born in Vienna, Austria on February 6th, 1929. His father Moritz pictured here. And, oh, and his mother and here is Rosa. His father owned a wholesale silk business called Leuchter and Granig. My father was an only child. He had many friends and he and his parent went, parents went on vacations and had a pretty good life. On March 12th, 1938, all that changed as that's when Germany annexed Austria, otherwise known as the Anschluss. At this point, the borders were all closed. On Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, Kurt was sent home early from school at about 9.30 in the morning. On his way home from school, he saw a synagogue burning and the SS were shooting and dragging the men out of the synagogue, forcing them to throw the Torahs, our Jewish Bibles, into the Danube River. He hurried home. When he got to his apartment building, he saw that the SS were arresting his father and nine other Jewish men. He asked them, where are you taking my father? But they just yelled at him to go upstairs. Kurt sat on the steps and cried while waiting for his mother, Rosa, to return from her shopping trip. She knew it was too dangerous to stay, so they walked three blocks to Kurt's grandmother's house. On their way, two SS approached them. One grabbed Kurt by the hair and the other grabbed Rosa by the hair and threw them down onto the street. A woman passerby tried to help them, but the SS threatened her with being sent to Dachau concentration camp. When they got to Kurt's grandmother's house, Kurt's cousin Heinz and his aunt Paula were there as well. 10 days later, there was a knock at the door. They were afraid to open it because they thought it was the SS. But Aunt Paula looked through the peephole and saw somebody looking very dirty and disheveled and thought it was probably safe to open the door. Upon opening it, to their surprise, it was Moritz, my grandfather. Excuse me. He was held in an armory for the last 10 days and the SS treated him badly and threatened to cut off his finger if he couldn't take off his wedding ring, which thank goodness he was able to do. Moritz was told by the Nazis that they had three months to get their families out of Austria. Moritz was able to procure a visa via Genoa, Italy, and in February 1939, by way of Cologne, Germany, and Brussels, they ended up in Antwerp, Belgium. They had with them a few, they had with them a few suitcases and a bit of jewelry that they hid in their clothing. Here, Kurt learned how to speak Flemish and French, and things were quiet for a while. They ended up living very near a man who happened to be from the town of Brody, Poland, which happens to be Moritz's hometown, my grandfather. He moved to Vienna when he was a little boy. One night, when my father Kurt was eavesdropping on his parents' conversation, he heard that the neighbor would let them hide a bit of jewelry in a washcloth in his basement wall. On May 10th, 1940, everything was upended again and at 6 a.m. in the morning, the Germans invaded Belgium. All the Jewish men were arrested. Moritz was deported by the Belgians to the south of France. In July of 1940, Rosa and Kurt were moved to a detention camp in Limburg, Belgium. Aunt Paula and the cousin were still in Antwerp. Paula didn't look Jewish as she had blonde hair and blue eyes. So she approached the Gestapo to get papers for them to move to Paris, France and was given permission. They lived there for about two months, but they wanted to be near Moritz. So they hired a guy to take them across the demarcation line. It was very dangerous. They crossed at night with 14 other Jews. The SS were guarding the border with guard dogs and machine guns. Luckily, they crossed without incident and at this point boarded a train for Marseille in the south of France. Aunt Paula and the cousin got off in Toulouse. Kurt and Rosa were supposed to go to Marseille, as I said, but accidentally got off on the train, got off the train one stop before, which was extremely dangerous because they had no ID papers. Somehow, at 11 years old, Kurt had the wherewithal to push his mother through the train station. They registered with the Jewish agency and were put in a detention camp called Hotel Terminus. By this time, Morris was in three different camps, Saint-Cyprien, 
Gers, which I had mentioned earlier in my mother's story, but they were in different sections and never crossed paths, and now, Caen les Mille. My father was able to bring food to his father on the weekends. The camp was about 30 miles from where he and his mother were. At one point, Rosa and Kurt were moved to the same camp. All three were able to get a pass to go to the city of Marseille, and my father had his bar mitzvah there at a synagogue. Soon after that, though, in August 1942, Kurt's parents were given that same difficult choice to turn their son over to OSE. And on August 9th, 1942, they signed the papers. This is the last letter that Rosa and Moritz, my grandparents, wrote to Kurt. Basically, it says, my grandparents were looking for my father to procure food for them and that he should take care of everything and to please make them proud. Months later, Kurt found out that Rosa and Moritz were both killed in the gas chambers in Auschwitz. Kurt was now in a place called Hotel Bonpart, which was repurposed as a detention camp. The conditions were not good here either, obviously. So he and some friends decided to escape one night when the French police were drunk. They got caught and were brought back to Bompar. The second time they escaped, they were more careful and went undetected. Somehow they knew that there was a home sponsored by OSE called Majelier, pictured here. There, my father was able to procure food from nearby farmers and on a bicycle with a wagon. Here is where he met a young girl named Edith, who he liked, but as I mentioned before, she was not a fan. Kurt and his friends were told they could go to the port of Marseille and board a ship for the United States. But at that point, the US had reached Africa and the German U-boats were bombing the armed forces. So he was sent back to the orphanage for a brief period of time. In February 1943, Kurt was moved to a boys' delinquent home in a town called Gelebois. The director of the home, Mademoiselle Burel, knew he was Jewish and she had a connection to the mayor of that town and they provided false papers to Kurt. His new name was now Claude Lambert. He too was supposed to be from Alsace-Lorraine because he was from Austria, so he spoke German and he was also learning French. Here he cooked and chopped wood and performed various other chores. Months later, somebody in the town squealed that there was a Jewish boy hiding in the home. So the Nazis came looking for him. He was hiding in an armoire for several hours. And luckily, the Nazis didn't open the closet. Mademoiselle Burel knew Kurt could no longer stay there and she made a connection for him to the Maquis, the French underground. And for the next year, Kurt lived in the woods and helped to blow up the last truck of German convoys and the rails that they passed. They received French, British, and American assistance. Upon liberation, he was sent to two more orphanages in Lyon, France, and in Paris. At one time, at one point, he went back to the neighbor in Antwerp, Belgium. Sure enough, the jewelry was still in the washcloth in the basement wall. He brought his father's gold pocket watch and his mother's bracelet and wedding ring to America. In Paris, he got a job making leather handbags and in the evening attended technical school. His uncle was already living in the United States and was able to get a visa for him. In August of 1946, he boarded the French troop ship called Athos with 67 other orphans and arrived in the port of New York on September 8, 1946. In January 1947, my father was standing outside the Museum of Modern Art on the sidewalk talking to his friends when who should tap him on the shoulder but Edith, the girl he liked in Majelier, the orphanage. They embraced and Edith must have seen something different in Kurt this time because they fell in love. And on August 13th, 1950, they were married, which coincidentally is my oldest son's birthday. In January 1952, my father was drafted into the US Army and spent nine months in Korea on the 38th parallel. Luckily, he made it home safe. 
He worked for Columbia Broadcasting System, which became CBS, and did TV repairs for a short while. Eventually, he became an aerospace engineer without a college degree. My father worked on the guidance navigation system of a couple of Ap different Apollo missions, and his name, along with several other hundred engineers, is still on microfiche, microfiche on the moon. Here is his signature and um, one of the plaques. And if you look behind me, on my left is, is a plaque that I have in my home. There's another one in this room as well. Um, and my father and my sister have plaques as well. <clears throat> in 2011, my father was awarded the Legion of Honor Medal for World War II veterans by the French government. When I read the letter that accompanied it, something just didn't jive. I knew my father was a Holocaust survivor, a Korean War veteran, and that his name was on the moon, but then realized for the first time that since he fought in the French resistance, he was also a World War II vet. In 2017, my family was fortunate enough to travel to my mother's hometown, Brussels, Germany, and we had five Stolpersteins installed. Stol Stolperstein means stumbling stone. The artist, Gunter Denmig, who isn't Jewish, started this project in 1996 in Berlin. He's pictured here. He lays these stones or brass markers in front of the homes of people who were deported, whether they were killed or not. Currently, there are over 75,000 Stolpersteins in 24 countries, and it's considered the largest deconstructed Holocaust memorial in the world. We had five installed for Yulia and Max Loeb, my maternal grandparents, for Heinz and Edith Loeb, my mother and uncle, and my maternal great grandmother, Matilda Weil. Matilda Weil's prayer book, pictured here, was used to recite a Jewish morning prayer during the ceremony in Bruxelles. The townspeople were absolutely wonderful in that they welcomed us with open arms and were extremely generous of heart. Several spent part of an evening and the day of the ceremony with my family. There was also an assembly at the local middle school with presentations by students. We also had the opportunity to visit my great-grandfather's grave, Moses Lowe, pictured here, in a nearby town who died long before World War II. I grew up on Long Island, New York, in a loving but complicated home. My parents were extremely overprotective, understandably so. My first experience with anti-Semitism was in first grade, when my classmate called me a dirty Jew. In junior high school, a boy set firecrackers in the stairwell as I left school. When I was 16 and home alone, the mailbox affixed to our house was blown up and eggs were thrown at the house on an occasional basis. At my current job many years ago, my former boss, who sat not too far away from me, was on the phone one day and I overheard him saying to a customer, well, why don't you Jew him down? And then more recently, in the last few years, my husband Mark and I overheard a couple of people who we know use the term Jewish lightning. I didn't even know what that was, so I went home and Googled it. Basically, what it means is when somebody burns down their business for the insurance money. How it became an anti-Semitic trope, I have no idea. In 2019, the brother of my classmate who called me a dirty Jew in first grade made a post on Facebook group of my high school and was sharing a lot of memories and also was apologizing for being a bully. I decided to add a comment mentioning that his, what his sister had said to me and he contacted his sister and she wrote me this email. My adult self is not shocked to see this given what was said and taught in my home, but I am no less ashamed horrified and saddened, especially when I see how this has stuck with you and hurt you so badly. If it's any comfort, I am not the same person and do not advocate hate against anyone and don't tolerate it in my life. Maybe it's some comfort in knowing that I have not continued to hurt others like I hurt you. Thank you for being open to my message. It's great to hear that it had a positive effect. 
In some ways, this changed my life and I get to add it to the story I tell. My parents, as was mentioned earlier, are 91 and 92 and live in Boynton Beach, Florida. My father is on an advisory board for Jewish Family and Children's Services to help allocate funds to survivors who need it. And he also volunteers for the Jewish War Veterans of America and shares his story at local schools. My mom sings in old age homes. My mother's last name is Loeb, which means strong man or lion. And my father's last name is Loister, which means candelabra. I'd like to think that the strengths and many branches of my family that now exist give us all light and hope for the future. Thank you for listening. What, what an incredible story. I, this is the first time I've heard all of it. I have heard Debbie speak at a local middle school, Dorseyville Middle School, which you've done for years as part of a large program that happens there, a day-long assembly that involves the whole school. And Debbie tells the story in sections, and I got to hear some of it before. Um, hearing it all together, it, it is really striking, um, the experience of both of your families, Kurt and Edith, um, the tragedy, also the triumph and the love. Um, your love story is really beautiful. And I was so happy to hear about it. Something, I tell you. After <laughs> being apart for four years, we didn't know each other. We have, where each one lived, although each one was. And this all of a sudden, just like that, she tapped me on the shoulder. <laughs> from the back. <laughs> you didn't see me. She was from the back. She tapped me on the shoulder. And you know, when the time is right, the time is right. That's that's the love story that the you first, the first thing I ask is, what's your phone number? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't want to miss an opportunity, right? When it came that's back right. around. Right. <laughs> you know, Lauren, when you listened to me that day at Dorseyville, um up until then, I only told my father's story. I think you know that, but I'm not sure. So I, this now, is all new. Yeah. Well, not new, but new to me telling it. It's so I, powerful to hear both yeah. families' stories. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I tried to, since we were only, the kids and, and us, we were only four. I made contact with all the cousins and everything, and they got, the kids got together, and thank God, the family group. Oh. Listen. We had to do that because we lost so much family, both of us, you know. Yeah, Philadelphia. I, I wish the kid. I w wanted the kids to have uh, some family, some something, you know. So thank God we pieced together everybody, friends, and uh, Israel, and all of us. So I really credit my father for keeping in touch with family and the next generation us and some some of the children have made a huge effort to do the same and i really don't think it would have happened if it would not were not for my father's efforts in communicating that's true we had never any use you know i mean we, we were growing up and uh, my parents got killed uh, half uh, half a year after the bar mitzvah mm. so you can imagine it you know i had to grow up myself and do things and lucky for the Jewish uh, help that we had in the uh, children home. Yeah, Jose, Jose they, helped. They really, lot. you know, we formed, I want you to know, we formed, I'm on the board by the way, we formed uh, the help? unit over here, it's called the OSE alumni and we send, we send money every year over to the, to the regular organization in France. That organization that did that started in, in, in 1917 in, in uh, St. Russia. Petersburg, Russia. Mm. And they came to France in the 30s, 32. And then they helped so many children. And a lot of the people that illegally worked under the Gestapo, under the, the Nazis, got killed in Auschwitz too, some of them. It's, it's horrible, but they helped a lot. 5,000 kids got saved, thank God. Because that, that was going to be my next question, because that's a very important story that 
I'm not sure how familiar people are with the story of the OSE, and it gives me an idea that, that we might get some of that content and make that available when we share your story with more and more people, because it is very important. And, and as you said, 5,000, and it's teenagers, mostly. I mean, I'll tell you, a lot of people didn't even know in France camps existed mm -hmm. like this. They didn't know. There's 20 camps. They didn't know about it. There was Cyprien, and Gilles, Lemil, and a few others, and the rest of the do in Toulouse. They only, of, they only heard of Auschwitz. That's what they're, they only Yeah, they only heard about that. They didn't hear about the other camps. It's, it was also striking to me, as Debbie was showing photographs and telling the story, how many different camps in France are part of this story. Yes. So yeah. very, very important for people to hear about this. And you're right, people, well, if, if they're familiar, they're familiar with Auschwitz. They're not familiar right. with it. Right. Especially American Jews didn't know much about and they, uh, the Jews know, in they Europe. They grew up, they had to learn different languages. You know, they had to go Flemish, they had to learn French, they had to learn English, you know. But uh, it, it was good. I mean, one day we learned a lot of languages. So you started to talk about this, but I wanted to ask you to, to tell us a little bit more about how your family was able to preserve photographs and yes. personal mementos and how, and then Debbie, how you were able to research more of the family's history for the presentation. I, I tell you what, this, we saved, the reason we saved all this stuff, we sent a lift over here because we were supposed to come to America. We had to have for with, with furniture and stuff. With, no, it wasn't furniture. It was oh, all so. linen and pictures. Yes and all that stuff. Furniture the Germans took. No. Yes. My mother sent furniture. Oh, maybe you over. did. I'm talking about the lift recently. She has come. Yes. So what happened is that all the stuff got here. My my uncles were here, two of my uncles got out of Kristallna and came to the United States. They just missed it by hair because the Germans almost put their hands on them. And uh, what happened is, after a while, they had to get jobs in New York and they had to work for a living. They couldn't afford to pay for the storage of the lift. So they got rid of a lot of stuff and they saved the pictures. They saved a few things, lots of pictures, and that's it. Then they gave it to me. So when I got all the pictures, then I was able to, you know, piece together that thing. And either told you about the, the jewelry, Lucky I was listening to my parents' conversation. That's the only way I could have. I, it came to my mind when it, when it was uh, after the war. I said, gee, they left something at my father's friend. He had a milk business, butter business. In Antwerp. And he, in Antwerp, and he hid it in the wall. I overheard this conversation just like that. And I went back, and uh, it was a Jewish man also. For, and he happened to be from the same town as my father. So they were friends, they became friends. And what happened, I went back, he was alive, but his daughter and his wife were killed in Auschwitz. So he told me he got something. I said, I know, I know where it is. It's in your basement, <laughs> um, in the wall. So he, did, yeah. he, he was a very, very good, nice man. So um, my father was talking about, there were some very, very large portraits that were sent in this storage container. Uh, but the two pictures that are in my presentation that are small of his mother and father, those were their passport photos. And my father was able to hide them in his papers and carry them with him throughout the war. And your question about researching the story. So most of the research wasn't research because ever since I was a little girl, my parents have been telling their story to me, but in snippets and pieces and not necessarily in order. Um, when I was 16, I recorded my father. Let me and... one correction. Oh. The pictures were not with me when I was in the underground and the resistance. They were kept by somebody. Oh, you Ozark. never told me that. They were kept in the Ozark because with my paper, I have my birth certificate and my, my actual papers, my passport, my German passport or my uh, working papers from France, they all were hidden in the old thing. Okay. 
they, so, they hid him before I got I got into these things. I couldn't be hidden, hiding somewhere right. with the papers. Right. So it's interesting, Lauren. Before I continue um, responding, there's always a piece of information that I didn't know, and I didn't know that piece of information. So as I said, my parents talked to me ever since I was a little girl, but not always in the order of the story. So as I said, I take my father when I was 16. And then when my son was in middle school, as part of a project, he had my father write down his story and then read it to a class. And that was the start of me speaking, my father's um, written story. I've been asking questions for years. And like I said, I'm always learning something new, but the other research was actually inadvertently done by other people. Um, I found some photographs on the internet, like of the camps. And then as we were preparing to go to Brussels, Germany to have the Stolpersteins installed, a few years prior, we were contacted by a couple of different people who also filled in some holes and had some documents and pictures that they were able to provide to us. So what was it like to go back to Germany following on your comment about the installation of the Stolpersteine? What was it like to go back, Debbie, for you and, and for your, well, for your mother and then your father going back to Austria? What was, what was that experience like after the war? So dad, why don't you respond about when you went back when you were much younger, but once you were in America? Uh, I went back with the children to Germany. Edith Kell, she I couldn't walk. She has trouble walking and everything. She couldn't do it. Right, but we went back in 1973. That's yes, it. in 73, yeah. and she wasn't well. So she didn't go. So what happened is, excuse me, I just want to get rid of something. Okay. Um, yeah, so we went back, but we went before back, Edith and I, years before. And I'll tell you the truth, when I went back to Austria, the shelter where we lived, we went to her town also. You could tell the Nazis in the face. So what happened is when we went back, they couldn't look in the face of the older people. The kids, the younger people, we have nothing against. They're not that fault. No, they, they had nothing to do with it. But the ones that are our age and a little older, they, they're the ones that are the real Nazis. So what can you tell you? I couldn't look in their face. I wouldn't even say, look the other way. I, I just couldn't take it. Because I could see the Nazis in their faces. That, that's what, what it is when you go back. That's what you saw. But now, the young people now, most of the old, time, old ones are gone. If you go now, probably you can talk to almost anybody. But unfortunately, there's also a lot of Nazis in, in, in the yes, United States. There's a lot of them here. Right, and I tell you right now, I saw this coming. When I came here, when I told the children, I said, don't, don't expect it can't happen here. It's a, so, it's a sad situation. So um, in answer to your question about how I felt, well, when we went in 1973, I was 12. And I remember going to where they lived, but I have to be honest, for me, there wasn't that much connection. However, when we went back in 2017, it was much different because as an adult, I saw everything through different eyes. And I already mentioned how wonderful the people in the town were. I, I do believe that the children and the grandchildren of German citizens that lived through World War II do harbor some guilt. And I think they're trying to make amends and, and change the future. So I have hope because of that. I tell you, the people that have been back now with uh, the children, to, to, for Stolpersteine, these people that lived in the town where my wife comes from, they were very, very nice. Even the mayor, a woman mayor. Yes, she, she wrote to me. She, she, she wrote, wrote to Edith. Very, very nice people, I tell you. They were not Nazis. So they, I mean, not everybody yeah. was, but uh, I would say 85% were. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to. Uh, the, tell you know some people are good and some aren't 
when we went back in 2017, we were able to meet my mother's first grade classmate, not Jewish, and her really? family. It was incredible. And, and I actually keep in touch with the daughter who's, who's my age. See, that, that is really lovely. And, and Edith, you were very young. You were a girl at that yeah. time. So, yeah, I, was. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's another important piece of that. So Debbie, when you say um, your mother's classmate, we're talking about a, a woman now who was a girl. So we're not talking about the adults who were the Nazis or were the perpetrators. Right. So there were children, children were Nazis also. Yeah. Well, that's because they learned from their parents. Learned from their parents. You had the, yes. you had the, 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 the Hitler youth. Yes. I mean, they were all they from, uh, from 12 years up. This is a very important point, especially for the students who hear this story, for them to know that children were also brought in. Indoctrinated. Indoctrinated. Yeah. Thank you. They were you. put in uniform. I'm telling you. They wore the uniform. And they had to, say, they had to sing all the songs from a middle. I, I know in school. Well, I was in school songs. with them. Yeah. So, All when, the songs. so to, to both of you then, and, and on this point, um, what was it like for you growing up? And did you see changes happening in Germany and Austria with the rise of Nazism? Were you aware of what was happening? Yes, we were. My parents always said, my parents found out actually what happened is, and I'm still thinking, I don't know why they didn't leave, in 1936, before Hitler became in 38, the Anschluss. In 36, the Chancellor was murdered by the Nazis. Dolfus, his name was Dolfus. And at that time, people too started to talk about uh, anti-Semitism and Nazis and all that. So I overheard, you know, things and I didn't think anything of it because I was a kid. Mm. But then, then when you realize what was happening, when we walked in, and they start overnight, the uh, swastika flags everywhere, overnight, from the red, white, red to, to a big swastika. I mean, Mom, I you couldn't believe it's at six o'clock in the morning, this happened. Mom, were you going to say something? Yes, my father, my mother said, you go to America first, to, to, she said to my father, and then we will come. We will get affidavits. And, uh, but it was too late, but thank God my father was here. And then, so I, then I came and unfortunately we couldn't get my brother anymore because my aunt sent him away. I said that and she sent him to Frankfurt. Yeah, in, in an orphan home. And then he went, got to Auschwitz. The first day I and got in then Auschwitz. No, we had, we had the papers to come here, but my father was born in Poland, and the quota for Polish people was so bad that you had to wait three years, four years, maybe, who knows? My mother and I would have come, but they didn't want to separate. No, the German and the Austrian quotas were lower, so people could come. Yes. Still come. We, my, my mother and I were both born in Vienna. We could have come, but she didn't want to leave my father, and I can't blame her. So, I mean, I sure when people hear that, that it makes sense that your family didn't want to separate if it could be helped. But to hear about the quotas, that's, that is complicated because mm -hmm. immigration to the United States was by country of origin. Yes. So, so, I mean, we actually have a lot of really good information about that. So I'm, I'm happy when things that come up that are complicated are things that we can elaborate separately so that everyone who hears it will understand what it meant if you were born in Poland and you were trying to come here versus born in Germany or Austria. The quota for Pol the Polish people was absolutely insane. I mean, the people had to wait years to, to come. And Austrian quota and German was uh, very easy. Because there was preference for, for Western and Central Europe in yes. the immigration yes. quotas. But there was another problem. When he marched in to Austria, if, he, if you didn't uh, apply at the consulate immediately, if you waited five, six months, it's too late. I'm glad that we're talking about this because one of the questions that students also ask is why didn't the Jews leave? And it's important to know that it was very complicated to leave, even for people who decided quickly to leave. 
if you yeah. didn't register right away after a month or so, two of them, then the Germans walked in. Forget it. They already have a problem. It was so bad. There were lines at the transfer at the Vienna, and no ending lines of people to apply. My parents didn't even know about it because my uncles didn't say anything that they applied. If they would have said something, maybe they would have been out. Who knows? You don't know. Right. Right. So, Debbie, I want to turn it back to you for a second. And some of this we already got into just through the natural flow of our conversation. But I'm, I want to hear what it was like for you to grow up as a child of two survivors. And we've heard a little bit that your parents did talk. But even in this conversation, you learned something that you hadn't heard before. So that's part of the value of, of having both of you here, Kirk and Edith. Thank you so much for being on this call so people can see in action that even when you talked about it, it doesn't mean that you talked about everything. So Debbie, what was it like for you growing up? Um, so growing up first generation American and a daughter of survivors was, was a unique way to grow up. Um, as I mentioned, my father was extremely overprotective. Um, I do re specifically remember crying in the bathroom, which is the only room in the house that could be locked, um, crying that I had no grandparents. Um, in terms of them telling the, us the stories, so as I said, it wasn't always in order, but I didn't know, I think ever since I was four, um, I will tell you that my father was extremely open about his experience, except for when he was when he was in the underground. And my mother, I believe, held back a lot of emotions. And I think that some things were just much too hard to talk about. But I feel extremely fortunate that they were willing to share it with me so that it's now part of my story. And it should not be forgotten. Right, Mom. That's right. So I have a question that just flows naturally from what you just said, but I know that you have sons. Are they also interested in carrying forward the stories? Um, honestly, not so much. They're, they listen to me. They, I know that, but my having boys, they don't always tell you things. So I think they might be doing things without me knowing. But I know that my younger son recently asked me for a copy of my mother's story. So um, they participated last month. I did a presentation for my synagogue and, and, and some friends, and they were part of it. But um, my niece is a little more involved in telling their story. Um, that's that's really a hard call, Lauren. I think as the generations go on, it's going to become more and more difficult to carry on their legacy. And that's exactly what this generation's group that we have, and Debbie has a leadership role in that. That is what we're doing because we see at the Holocaust Center the value of the descendants of Holocaust survivors being involved and keeping these stories alive. And we do have some grandchildren of survivors who are involved and we'll have more and more because it is, it, it's very important. It's a very important role for your families to play. I agree. But he is. No, for, for sometimes they didn't want to talk about it. Of course. Because in the first few years, they don't want to talk about it. But then you realize that you have to, because you have to tell them. Otherwise, the story dies completely. It'll die anyway. It will. Like, it will. I can guarantee you. Hundreds of years from now, it I will be part of history. That's right. People will not bring it forward. Right now it's fresh, good for several years. But I'm telling you, it's not gonna, it's gonna die. I'm sorry, but that's the terrible part. Like all of, all of history. All of history. Well, we, we exist to preserve history. So we're going to keep doing it. And if we do our jobs well, people will come after us who are just as committed to keeping a record of this and keeping the stories right. alive. We'll see what's happening. Right. Yes, and it, right. You know, you get feedback, so you know. I hope so. Well, part of the reason that people don't want to hear the stories, although many people do, but some people don't because it's so painful. And, mm -hmm. and I'll yeah. say that, Debbie, hearing you tell the story, it was very emotional to listen to, and I could tell it was emotional to tell. 
So I'm wondering, Debbie, where you draw your strength in order to tell these deeply personal and emotional stories. Honestly, I draw my strength directly from my parents. Um, there's so many survivors and may I add liberators who are unable to tell their stories um, because it was just too painful to do so. Yes. But yes. I feel so fortunate that they share their experiences with me so that I can carry on their legacy in, in hopes to educate others so that the past will not repeat. I, I think education is the answer and the younger, the better. Yes. And as, as long as I can do it, I'll do, talk about it too. Right. In the schools or whatever. And it's so powerful for people to hear directly from you um, as, as, the, as the witness to this, as the person mm -hmm. who, lived, who lived through we, it. If, uh, we can't forget. I mean, it's, a, no, no, it's no, something no. that, uh, you know, stuck in. You sometimes wonder, how did we go through this? How did we manage? You know, we ask ourselves the question, you know? I mean, I was in danger so many times, twice in the war twice in World War II and as being Jewish and then Korea and, and the resistance. I mean, I, thank God, you know, it's something, somebody must have been up there watching. Probably, probably so. I mean, it is but incredible. And out, your name's on the moon now, after all I, of that. When I, when I came out, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe anymore. I said, how could it be? It took my parents and everything else, but then when you grow up and get older, you think about it, you say, look how you survived. Um, I have a last question that brings us to current events, and it, it has come up that there's rising anti-Semitism, and Debbie mentioned times in, um, in her life when she has experienced anti-Semitism. So my question is that systemic racism has been an ongoing problem in the United States for over 400 years. Um, this is really, come to the fore over the last few weeks. So we're right now at the intersection of COVID-19 and people being at home and sheltering in place for the most part. And now we have had weeks of protests across the United States protesting police violence. So um, with the racial justice protests in many American cities, most recently have brought longstanding problems in society in this country, in the United States to light. What lessons can we take from the Holocaust to apply now to persistent racism and civil rights in the United States? So I really believe that just as the next generation of Germans are making amends, I think here in America, people live in a society that was built on the injustice of slavery, even though they didn't create it and are responsible for correcting it. And I don't believe this country has ever really come to terms <clears throat> with its historical wrongdoings and teaching the Holocaust and its lessons. I hope it's an example of why we need to stand up to intolerance in any form against anyone. Um, I, I'm not sure if you asked this question, but I know you, you had wanted to know about what we can do as individuals, Lauren. That would be my follow-up, yes. I want to know what individuals can do on their own in our communities to combat forms of prejudice in the present time? I think, I think we can do plenty. Um, silence is definitely complicity. Um, we can stand up to those who are making racist comments. We can, um, as students, we can <clears throat> report the bullying to the teacher. We can speak up when we witness any form of injustice and you should never be a bystander, always an upstander and volunteer in your community and go outside your box and meet people from different back backgrounds. And as I said earlier, I believe education is the answer. Children need to be taught these lessons in school, just like another subject is taught like math or spelling. And um, diversity education, I think is imperative in, in local governments and law enforcement. And I just wanted, the, the last thing I just wanted to mention is in the, in the Talmud, the Jewish book of law, it states, he who saves one saves the world entire. And can you imagine if every person did that, this world would be a very different place. Debbie said it. Very good. Very, very good, Debbie. Yes. Yeah, that That's was really beautifully stated, yes. That's it, she's got it. Lauren, correct me if I'm wrong, but 
I believe that most of the story, excuse me, most of the uh, Holocaust curriculums in schools focus more on um, starting like in 1933 and what led up to 1938 and the war and the concentration camps. But I'm wondering how much is focused on other ways of surviving. There's, there is some on other ways of surviving and the Holocaust Center has made an effort to tell stories of resistance. And of course, eighth graders read about Anne Frank. So right. we also talk about other ways that children were hidden. So children hidden under false identities and in plain sight rather than hiding locked up in an attic as Anne Frank was. So we do have some of these stories, but there's definitely room to broaden the curriculum to include, I mean, there are so many experiences. We talked today about how many camps there were in France. Mm. People don't know that. No, the Americans never knew about those they camps. They never knew those camps existed. They, they never heard that. And what happened, they were sent, when Belgium was occupied, they sent all the men up to near the Pyrenees. I know why the Belgian government did that. It was, it was under French supervision, under the Vichy government, let me put it this way. And if, as long as it was under the Vichy government, it wasn't too bad. I mean, it was bad, but not, not like in the Nazis. You know? Now, when the Germans started to take over, then things just got worse. So this is another thing, and this comes up, Edith, when you talk about how people learn about Auschwitz, is that Unfortunately, the way that people are learning about the Holocaust, they don't have an understanding of the geography, mm -hmm. That's right. of the scope of the Holocaust, the scope of the devastation. That's right. So this is another thing that we work to correct when we're teaching because, mm -hmm. I mean, in order even for Holocaust denial is a serious, serious matter. And if students think that the Holocaust happened in Germany, you know, say this is Germany and maybe a little bit in Poland, you, you don't have six million people. And it fuels the deniers if we don't tell the story of how broad a geography it was. Well, the Auschwitz was the biggest uh, killing field. field. You know, I mean, that and, and the one, uh, which one was there? There was another couple. That were, but Auschwitz was the biggest one. Right, so there are not also the most famous. The most right. famous. But but not and but not only were there countless concentration camps, there was also the mass that, graves that the Einsatzgruppen yeah. killed people outside the villages and they're just uncovered. They shot them in the yeah, in the ditches. In the, they right. took them they, right. Right, so you have to understand that the Nazis went into what was the Soviet Union and that they had a different method of murder there. That it's all, these are terrible stories, but all of these stories together are what happened in the Holocaust. Did you believe I saw Hitler 600 feet from me? Where? In Vienna, in Vienna. In Volkswagen too, he came to Volkswagen. Yeah, and in Vienna, he was, he was on the street coming with the car. You have no idea how this guy was guarded. There was the SS in the front, the SR in the second group, the Wehrmacht in the third group, and the Gestapo in the roof. You have no idea. I've seen it as a kid. Incredible. Oh my goodness. He was riding in his car with his head up. Mm. I'm just letting that image sink in. Mm -hmm. Incredible, incredible. So let me ask all of you, is there anything we didn't talk about that you want to be sure people hear before we conclude? I think it did say what we went through it and it did pretty much good job. I we, mean, co we covered a lot. You did a really good yeah, job. We did, we did. I'm yeah. sure, I'm sure you're going to add in there what, you, what notes you took. You Lauren, you asked, um, I think it was in the, in the list of questions about um, what kind of impact anti-Semitism had on me. Yes. So I talked about the incidents specifically. Um, you know, that's one of the main reasons I tell my parents' story. I pay attention to the news a bit obsessively about anti-Semitic incidents. Um, 
that I sometimes feel like I need to pull back. So I'm passionate about telling my parents' story and I, and I read a lot, but for my own mental health, sometimes it's important to pull back and not always pay attention to it. Similar to what's going on right now, it's imperative that we all pay attention to systemic racism, racism and resolving the problem, which is gonna take, you know, not just a village, but you know, like the whole world, but you also have to preserve your mental health. And so anti-Semitism, unfortunately, is a large part of my life. What you just said, Debbie, thank you for saying that. It's so important because um, I would say anti-Semitism is a much larger part of my life than it was for a long time. And that's true of certainly anyone Jewish living in Pittsburgh, but it's not only Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And with other things that are happening in the news right now, if we feel a responsibility to, to improve this country, and it is our duty to do that, if we feel that responsibility, it can be overwhelming and exhausting. And I too have felt that. I have felt the negative impact of being on the news all the time and really plugged in 24 hours a day. We can't do that. This is a marathon and we need to stay strong and take care of ourselves. Right. So um, let's, let's commit to doing that. And one, one thing that we have going for us is community like we're seeing right now in this conversation that we have the example of survivors who survived and rebuilt wonderful lives, have wonderful children like Debbie, and we're able to bring these stories to everyone and, and spread hope that you know we can survive, we can get through this, and we have important things to contribute to the world. That's good. Now you've yeah. got, you got a big closed uh, Jewish family in Pittsburgh. We have a wonderful Jewish family. I know, in Pittsburgh. I know. Absolutely. I know. Absolutely. Well, well, well. <laughs> I want to count you in that family. Can I do that? Okay. All right. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. I can't, I can't thank you enough for being part of this conversation, Edith and Kirk and Debbie. Right, thank you me. for bringing us all together. This is just I'm very so happy. Very, very happy. So, very so happy. happy to spend time with you. What yeah. a special thing to do today.